All right. A little shy today, aren't we? Okay. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Do I need to yell? All right, guys. Hey, I do know we've got um, a couple people that are got some illnesses coming up. Todd back there in his back, his son, uh, in, in his back. <laughs> Your back's good, right, Todd? Todd in the back, his son just had surgery on his mouth um, this past week, so keep Dylan in your prayers. Our son Brody's having surgery tomorrow morning, early in the morning, and then Kirsten, Mark and Kirsten, blonde hair, I'm not sure if you guys, well anyways, she's having heart surgery tomorrow, so keep her in your prayers as well. So she's going in at uh, 10.30, and I think surgery starts at 1, so keep, keep, uh, keep Dylan in your prayers for healing, right Todd? Want all that to work out good. Um, Brody's having, you know, he'll need healing too. And his surgery is what, 7 in the morning? Okay. So, speaking of Brody, and then Kirsten is is about 1 o'clock. So, speaking about Brody, yesterday my family celebrated one year of Brody being officially a part of our family. Right? And August 13th, 2015, we adopted him. He officially became a Vanderford. Sorry, dude, you're stuck, right? And uh, and became our son. So Jack's gained a brother. We grew our family. Brody came into our house when he was 14 months old. Uh, we, we loved him from day one. We took care of him, provided for him, treated him as our own, right? Parents, the good and the bad. Amen, right? So the good and the bad, the joys and the difficulties. Um, he was ours. We were his. For a while, if Brody would get in trouble or thought he was in trouble, did anybody, does anybody know Brody? People know who Brody is, right? He's a little about this tall, right? And if Brody was in trouble or thought he was in trouble, we would see him try extra hard to make sure that we still loved him. All right? I remember him sitting at the dinner table. I sit here and Brody sits next to me and... Uh, Something happened. He, he either threw his food on the floor, fed the dog, something, fed Levi, I don't know, man. Something he wasn't supposed to be doing. And so and I remember correcting him, letting him know, Brody, your actions are, are not okay. That's not good, right? This is a little correction time. And Brody, as he always does, Brody will say, okay, daddy, or yes, daddy, right? That's something we've taught him. Yes, daddy, right? And so, and then at that time, he would start following it up with stuff like this. He would just stop and he'd be like, Hi, Daddy. Hi, Daddy. Or, Hi, Mommy. Hi, Mommy. And then he would have this little smile on his face and really kind of force you to smile. And then he would say stuff like this. He's like, Daddy, I like you. I like you, Daddy. I like you, Daddy. And then he'd ask this question. You like me? Right? You, you like me? Jessica and I picked up pretty quick that when he got in trouble, he seemed to think he had to earn back our graces, like he had to earn something. He wanted to make sure we still noticed him, that we didn't forget about him, and that we still loved him. What Brody didn't understand was that he wasn't just there because he was cute and because he was a good boy. He was there in our home. He was a part of our family because we loved him. We wanted to raise him. Amen, parents? You guys with me, right? We wanted to raise him. We wanted to protect him and teach him and provide for him. We wanted to pray with him and, and teach him how to pray and how to, how to love Jesus. We wanted to teach him about Jesus. And, and uh, so, so we do, parents, right? You, we want a good boy, right? We want a good child. We want him to make good decisions. We want him to obey us, to trust us, and to follow us. We want all those things to happen. However, he doesn't always follow directions right he doesn't always make the right decisions right i'm sure you guys as kids are you know different and they do but ours don't always make the right decisions and but one thing is that has zero effect on our love for him it doesn't take away from our desire to care for him to raise him to protect him right he's stuck with us man he he's our he's our son he doesn't need to be perfect or to do something special to remain in our family. It's not like when we adopted him that we said, okay, judge, we love him. We're going to bring him into our family if he commits to do this. Right? I'm sure Brody was like, yeah, I'm on that one. Like, can you read my ex's signature, right? That's not... <laughs> Brody, you got to bring something to the table to be a Vanderford, right? That's not how it works, is it, parents? Right? It's just not how it works, right? You bring everything to the table, as the parents. And this morning, keeping that in mind, I want us to look at Acts chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, open there. There's some at the end of your rows. Um, 
by the way, sometime throughout the past or about throughout the sermon, if you can fill out that uh, uh, binder there, just lets us know that you're here. Allows us to follow up with you. We won't, you know, harass you or anything, but lets us know that you're here. Up to this point in Acts, we've seen the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ first in Jerusalem. Right, And then it begins to spread throughout the world. Last week we looked at the church in Antioch. We saw many believers begin sharing the Gospels, first to Jews only. And then it was immediately followed up with others sharing the Gospel with those that were not Jews. Those were Greeks or Gentiles. Other, All people were hearing the Gospel of Jesus Christ in Antioch. People were getting saved. They were trusting Christ as their Savior. Both Jews and Greeks were becoming part of the family of God. While I'm sure Brody's excited about being a Vanderford, I'm more excited about one day him being coming part of the family of God. Amen? Parents, right? You guys with me? We want our friends. We want want our our family to know Jesus. They heard the gospel. They heard that Jesus being God was the promised Messiah, that he came to die for their sins, to to bring forgiveness, to raise. Uh, He was raised from the dead and he brought new life. He brought eternal life. They heard that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, and he alone was the way to the Father. Right? You don't have to believe in Jesus and this other guy. You don't, you know, there's not, there's not a million ways up the mountain, right? There's Jesus. And Jesus al- alone was their salvation for their sin. That's what they're hearing. That's what they're learning. That's, that's, that's good stuff. And going back to the story with Brody, man, we don't, we don't know everything that happened. We know that he had a, a rough time, uh, in the first 14 months. So we don't really know what led him to believe this, but he seemed to think he had to bring something to the table to ensure our love and to ensure that he would be part of our family. So we get the awesome reminder to say, that's not how it works, Brody. You're ours, man, whether you like it or not, right? And uh, so thinking about that, take a look with me at Acts chapter 15. I want us to see how some tried to muddy up the gospel. We're going to see how some tried to add and, and take away from the gospel. Possibly... Making people think, what am I missing? Was I supposed to bring something to the table to be saved in my life? Did I miss something? Did, did, uh, did these, these people that are, did, did they lead me astray? Did they only tell me half the story? Do I only have to, do I have to do this and this to be saved? So we're going to kind of walk through that together and we're going to see what it looks like for salvation. We're going to look at grace. We're going to look at, uh, at, at just what these men were doing. So beginning in verse one, it says this, some men came down. From Judea and began teaching the brethren. They're teaching them this. Unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. So what's happening here is, let me give you a little bit of background before this verse. Paul and Barnabas, we talked about this last week, they were sent out by the church at where? Church at Antioch. All right. They were sent out by the church at Antioch on their first missionary journey. They're, they're out there doing their thing. They're out sharing the gospel. They're spreading the gospel, seeing people give their lives to Christ. And even you'll even see in the passage, it talks about how they endured physical harm, stoning, because of what they were doing. They're out sharing the gospel, and they're enduring this physical harm, but the Lord brings them back safely to Antioch. And Paul and Barnabas, they're excited, they come back to Antioch, and they give this report. Luke writes this, Luke is the author of Acts, he writes this in chapter 14, verse 27. When they, Paul and Barnabas, those the missionaries, when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. By the way, let me point this out, church. These men are giving Jesus credit for the work, amen? And Jesus is getting credit for that. So so they were they were acknowledging they were participants in the work that God was doing, and God was opening the doors, not just to the Jews, but now also to the Gentiles. So they came back, and then in verse 1, we have these men, they're known as Judaizers, so if you hear me say that, that's what I'm talking about, it's these men that are kind of adding and take away from the gospel a little bit, they've made their way down to Antioch to tell them something. It's almost like they're up in, they're up in Judea or Jerusalem, wherever they're at, and they're up there in Jerusalem, and they're like, oh, wait a minute, there's people getting saved down here, let's go tell them really how it is, right? So they make their way down there, they make their way down there, and then they kind of tell them, hey... Y'all, you guys aren't, did they say y'all over there in the Mideast? I think, man. Y'all, okay. You're not really saved if you haven't done the whole circumcision thing yet, men, right? Ladies can't do that. So, right, so like men, you're not saved if you haven't been circumcised. Now, just real quick, if you don't know what circumcision is, it's the the cutting, I'm not going to tell you in detail, okay. It's the cutting of flesh on males, and it would form a complete circle. You guys with me? It formed a circle. And this circle was a sign showing the covenant between God and the descendants of Abraham. 
If you want to learn more about that, I encourage you to. It's a great passage, Genesis 17, and the surrounding passages. You're going to see instructions laid out for Abraham from God. Why are we to be circumcised? When are we to have it done? Right? Who's supposed to have it done? And it was meant to show the covenant between the descendants of Abraham, the, Jew, you know, the Jews, and, and God. So now you have these non-Jews, these Gentiles, these Greeks that are getting saved... They've trusted Christ as their Savior. They've believed in His gospel. And they've received His grace. And they're saved, right? They're saved. And now you have these guys come in and say, man, it's not just Jesus, guys. It's not just His grace. Right? It's grace and Jesus plus something. And I'm going to tell you, church, this is something we still struggle with today in our churches throughout the world today. Not just, you know, here, but throughout the world. Jesus saves us by His grace you know, and then we'll have some that, that come along and whether, whether it's a church or a pastor or a leader or a teacher of some sort or just somebody and they, they come along and they say, man, you're not really saved unless you trust in Christ, right? And confess him as Lord and do this. You have to bring something to the table to really be saved. They will say, man, it's salvation plus something. There's a word for that. It's called legalism. Right? Legally, legalism is a performance-based kind of faith. It causes us to focus on ourselves. It causes us to kind of have some self-glory here. Like, we need help with that, right? right? It, it causes us to do that. It causes self-glory. And, and really, it puts way too much focus on the external, the way that we look. You're looking good today, Levi, man. Just throwing that out there. I've got ADD this morning. You're just going to have to work with me, okay? But, you know, you're, you're just... Uh, I met with Levi this past week, and I had to apologize to him like ten times. Like, got ADD today, man. He's like, you're good, Jeff. All right. Legalism is a performance-based kind of faith. It puts way too much focus on external, the way that we look, and causes us to neglect the heart, our internal. It, it, it keeps us from being humble. Legalism is an attempt to gain favor with God. It's an attempt to gain favor with God, or even attempt to impress one another. By doing things or avoiding certain things. It's a pride issue, right? It's a pride issue. It's a flawed thought that God really isn't enough. For me to be saved, okay, Jesus did all this hard work. Yeah, I guess, yeah, he died and, and then yeah, he rose again, the big deal, right? And, you know, now salvation's for me, but now I've got to do the work, right? Now I've got to do something on top of that. Like, like God isn't really enough. I need to do something else. And today, we might see in our churches or certain circles that say, I mean, you might trust in God, but you're only fully saved if you go to church three times out of the month, right? Or if you're baptized, that's, that's, a, that's one. To, or if you do this and this and this. Now, hear me clearly. We are to be baptized, amen, right? We are to be a baptized, that's, that's obedience. We are to gather together as a church. We're to be committed and devoted to God's Word. We're to be devoted to one another. We're to be baptized. There are plenty of things that God in the Bible says we should be living this way. This is how we should walk in our life. Right, guys? This is how we should do it. But they're not salvation. Right? They're not salvation. When God saves us, He's the one that begins to transform us. And we learn to live a life that He's intended for us. But legalism, adding to what God has already had, it just it muddies everything up. It muddies, it muddies things up. It makes it confusing. So when you start adding to the gospel, this is in essence producing a different plan of salvation than what God has. Right? Are you guys with me? God has, says this, and we start adding to it. It's, it's really a different plan. Here's this, here it is. Ephesians 2, 9. It's pretty clear. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work so that no one can boast. If you have been saved, church, it's by the grace of God, you didn't deserve it. I know that's a tough one. I'll help you out. I surely didn't deserve it. Right? There's nothing that we deserve. Jesus gives it as a free gift. I like that passage I was talking with the membership class this morning. Right? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank God for that. Amen, guys? Why we were still sinners. It's a free gift. We didn't deserve it. So you place your faith in Him and in Jesus alone, and He saves you because of His goodness, because of His grace. There is nothing that you and I can do to earn salvation. Are you guys with me on that one? People have been trying through all of eternity, however long the world's been here, right, to, to earn God's grace. And, and there's nothing you and I can do. It. It's by God's grace alone, through Jesus Christ alone. 
So these men are coming and say, hey now, man, you got, you got to get the whole circumcision thing going on. You've got to do that or you're not really saved. They're kind of messing with it. And I really love this. You have Paul and Barnabas step in. Thank God for good godly men and women that know the word of God. Know, right? Are you guys with me? That can step in and say, wait, wait, you've crossed that line, brother. Right? And that's what you have happening here. You have Paul and Barnabas that kind of say, whoa, whoa, let's, let's talk about this, right? This, this is not okay. Verse 2, and when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, those words really mean that that great dissension, they weren't having a little discussion. They were going at it, man. This was an important issue. This is one of those hills to die on type thing, right? They're, They're going at it. The brethren determined, so they're having this debate, and the brethren, the church, determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles. So you have the, the, you had the 12 apostles that were hanging out with Jesus, right? Judas, you know, kind of excused himself from that, right? And then now you have the 11. So you've got Judas, and then you've got the other elders, the other uh, leaders in the church. So they're, they're to go up there to, concerning that issue. Paul and Barnabas, they're, they're, they're having this great discussion, and they say, man, go, the church of Antioch says, go up there, let, you know, talk with them about it, talk with these leaders up there. Verse 3, therefore being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the detail, it, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. I love this, man. Even though there's dissension, even though there's some issues, they're still rejoicing in what God had done on their mission, missionary journey and seeing those people come to Christ. Verse 4. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. Paul and Barnabas are, are not backing down on this thing. They're not accepting what these other men are saying. In fact, they're rejecting it as heresy. Right? This is, this is, a, this is a false gospel. This is a lie. Get this junk out of our church, right? And we, don't, we don't want any of this. In Galatians chapter 1, I always like to look at other supporting passages. And really, I love Paul, man. This dude does not mince words. He's, he's good with this. He writes in, in Galatians chapter 1, they're, they're dealing with the same issue. You have Christians that are leaning towards legalism, adding to the gospel, taking away from the, the, the power of God's grace and salvation. In verse 6, it says this, this is, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be a curse. This is a big deal. Paul is saying, if there's something different than the word of God being spoken, whether it's by me, whether it's by pastor so-and-so, whether it's by sister or whoever, even if it's an angel of God that is preaching, or an angel from heaven that is preaching something different than what God has already said, they're to be accursed. You guys with me? This is a big deal. Paul's not messing around here. And he said, brother, so, so I say again now, it says, as we have said before, I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, is be a curse. Paul and Barnabas are all on this thing, man. They're like, okay, man, we're, we're after this thing. You're preaching a false gospel. We're after it. There's no doubt how Paul feels about people trying to change the truth of the gospel. He's telling these men in Acts and then in Galatians also, stop distorting, stop changing the gospel. Jesus doesn't need you to do that. Right. So they arrive in Jerusalem to talk with the apostles and the elders about this issue. And Paul and Barnabas began telling them about how Jesus had used them to lead Gentiles to Christ, not Jews, but Gentiles to Christ. Right. And and, and so, you know, they're just telling this to this group. This is what's happening. Verse five. But some of the sect of Pharisees who had believed stood up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. So you have again, thank God for His grace, you have some Pharisees that come to be saved. They, they accept Christ as their Savior. The Bible says some of them believe. So these, these guys are saved. But they come out really in agreement with these other men and they say, man, no, we're, we agree with these guys. It's necessary to circumcise. And then they add to it and make them observe the law of Moses. Some have suggested, you know, I, this is a good thought, it's just a suggestion that, that these specific Jews felt like, man, especially with the Pharisees, man, we're losing control here, right? We're losing our grip, we were, the, we were in charge, so we're going to place this burden on these, these Jews. The, the Pharisees were good at that, adding other burdens on to people. 
for salvation. But we don't, it's just a, it's a thought just to throw that out there. But they were forgetting, these Pharisees were forgetting the completed work of Christ when Jesus has his arms outstretched on the cross and he cries out, Te telesta. It is finished. It is finished. He cries out, Jesus is saying, my work that I came to do. It's my work of redemption is complete. The punishment for all sin in the past, present, and future, it's all paid in full. It's finished, right? All they've got to do is believe on me, and they get it, that free gift. These Pharisees were forgetting that. And we have this contention just brought before the apostles and the elders. Then to verse 6, the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter, and there was had been... Or after there had been much debate, so they're, they're talking about it. Peter stands up. Thank God for Pete, right? Thank God for Peter. He kind of, we see him mess up a lot when Jesus is here on earth, but he always comes back to Jesus, right? That's, we, who can kind of relate? That's the right word. Who can relate to Peter, man? He just, man, he's, he's good. But after Jesus goes to heaven, the Holy Spirit comes down the day of Pentecost. Peter, Peter's, man, he stood up. Man, he becomes this leader, doesn't he, man? He just becomes this leader for this new church. And right there in Acts chapter 2, he begins to preach. And thousands of people got saved because he's obedient to God. Peter has been leading, and he does so here. He stands up after this debate, and he says, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. In, in, in this chapter, in chapter 15, there are going to be three different speeches we're going to talk about. And this is really the beginning of that first one. To show that what they're going to do is they're going to kind of show proof and give defense of salvation of God's grace alone. Like it needs like defense, right? But, but that's what's happening. So they're, they're standing up and they're just going to give proof and give defense of salvation by God's grace alone. And Peter stands up and he leads first. And he shares his personal story, how God spoke to him. He used him. He talked to him in a dream and, and used him back in Acts chapter 10 to lead Gentiles to Christ. Peter struggled with that. He's like, wait a minute, God, they're unclean. They're not, they're not part of the Jewish club, man. I don't, I don't know, right? And, and so God led him. Gentiles were saved when Peter shared the gospel with them. And I love this. It says uh, in verse 8, Peter goes on, he gives a solid argument. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did us. So Peter is struggling with this whole thing. I don't know, God, should I go share with these Jews or these Gentiles? He does. They get saved. And he's saying God knows the heart. He gives them the Holy Spirit. And he makes no distinction between us and them. No distinction between Jews and Gentiles cleansing their hearts by faith. Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it says this, speaking of the Jews, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They get saved, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit, amen? Man, He seals us to the day of redemption. He is, he is ready for us. He, he comes as soon as we accept Christ, as soon as we believe in, in Jesus Christ. So He does that with the Jews, and then we see the same thing happen in Acts chapter 10. This time with Gentiles. Right? He says this. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, he's, he's preaching the gospel to him, the Holy Spirit fell on those who were listening to the message. They were believing. They were trusting Jesus at that moment. All the circumcised believers, all the Jews that were with Peter, who came with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. And I love this, man. God knows the heart. You all look good today, right? But I can't see your heart. Some people are, you know, wear their, their, what's it called, wear their, uh, there you go. But we can't see their heart. We can't see their heart, and God sees their heart. God knows when we truly believe in Jesus and have a repented heart. Are you guys with me on that one? Man, you know, you go to, some people say, no, you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you got to do this. Man, God just says, man, I know your heart, and the moment that you believe in me, right, I'm there, right? I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. You're saved. Peter's saying that God knew their heart. He gave them the Holy Spirit. And right then and there, is that's, that's all the proof you need. Jesus, God has said, that's it. I, I, have, I approve it. That's all we need. God knows the heart and gave them the Holy Spirit. The Gentiles were given the same Holy Spirit that the Jews had. That's what Paul's saying. And God, God saved them. He didn't require anything else from them. It's not like Peter said, okay, uh, okay, now that you've been saved, now you've got to do this or the Holy Spirit's going to leave you and you're not going to be saved anymore. God didn't place any other burdens on these people for their salvation. They remained saved. Verse 10, Peter continues in his argument for the grace. 
Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the necks of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to, per, to, uh, to bear? Peter's not hating on the law. The, ha- the law was a good thing. It was a good thing for the nation of Israel, for God's people to have. It was meant to protect them, to guide them, to, to lead them, right? And, and, but but there, was, there was no way for an imperfect person to keep the law perfectly. Right, I look through scripture sometimes and I'm like, yeah, mess that one up today, right? Mess that one up today. I look at Proverbs 31, you know, and you look at the like a Proverbs 31 woman. And you look at that and you're like, yeah, there's no woman that can I mean, I love my wife. She's a godly woman. I love her, but right, the ladies, there's no way to to live up to everything in the Are you guys with me? Right? I mean, it's just impossible. It's just impossible to do that. So So Jesus comes and he brings that new covenant because we weren't able to to be perfect. And Peter says, why are you trying to push this off on them? We couldn't even do it ourselves. And you're trying to push it off on them. That's why Jesus came. And and Peter's saying, man, stop trying to burden them. We couldn't burden them. Stop trying it. And Peter concludes his speech with a key verse. This is a key verse in not only Acts, but really in all of the New Testament. Don't miss this when you guys with me. He says this in verse 11. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of Of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. It is only through the grace of Jesus that we're saved. Grace is a free gift. Follow this definition with me real quick. Grace is a free gift. It is favor shown to guilty sinners when we were left only deserving judgment. We didn't deserve Jesus dying on the cross, raising again, and giving us salvation. We deserve judgment because of our actions. And Peter says here, we have salvation, right? And we are saved only through the grace of Jesus. Jews and Gentiles both, we are both saved through the, through the free gift and grace of God. And these men here were trying to put their own stipulations on these new Christians. And that's a problem, church, right? Because then it's not, it's another gospel. It's not, it's not grace plus the, plus the pluses, right? It's grace is enough. We're singing about grace this morning, man. Your, your grace is enough, God. His grace doesn't need our help, amen? But we need His grace, right? His grace doesn't need our help. We need grace because we're unable. I've had the opportunity to share the gospel and tell people about Jesus time after time. And I've seen faces and shoulders and body language of people as, as, as I'm sharing God's word and I open it up to them and I just share the plan of salvation with them and they kind of get through this. You know, and I remember one time it was followed it up with, that's it? Right? That's it? I don't have to do this and this and this and this and this and because I was taught to be saved, to be a Christian or to be religious, to be a part of the family of God and to spend eternity with Jesus. I was told I had to do all of these things. I had to be at this place before I could accept Jesus. I had to do all these things. I had to believe plus do this and this and this and they're relieved. Right? Jessica and I, we got to sit with somebody that just says, I said, how do you feel? I feel relieved. Right? I feel relieved. I feel relieved too, right? That's a great reminder. Thank Jesus for taking that burden that we couldn't bear. Why do we want to add on to it, man? We're such control freaks. Man, we don't need to add on anything to it. Jesus just, he wants us to repent of our sins. We got to own up. Man, we're messy, right? We're disgusting people, right? Especially men, right, ladies? We're, we're, we're messy. And, and, but we're sinful. We need to repent of that sin. Repent is real, real simple. Have a change of mind, a change of direction. He wants us to repent of our sins and believe in Jesus. We're saved through the grace of Jesus. So let's stop adding adding things. We already have a hard enough time, right? Let's stop adding things. Anybody know who Charles Spurgeon is? Charles Spurgeon's a preacher known as the Prince of Preachers. He's a fantastic preacher back in the 1800s. I never met him. You know, it was a while back. but He says this, There is nothing under heaven that I can conceive more liable to lead men astray than a perverted gospel. A truth perverted is generally worse than a doctrine which all know to be false. Now, this isn't in my notes. This is free today, so I'm going to throw this out there. That's the problem we get when we just worry about religion. We take something that looks a little bit like Jesus and we start adding to it or taking away from it, and we call it Christianity. Right? 
We can look at other religions saying, yeah, that's not Jesus, right? We can get that, right? But it's whenever there's certain things that they call themselves certain things or they start teaching things that sounds a little bit like Jesus. That's when things lead people astray and keep people on the path to hell because they're preaching a false gospel. Let's, let's not lead men and women and young people astray by adding or taking away from God's grace. And his gospel. So Peter, he stands up and he speaks against this legalism and adding to the gospel. And he really lays it out there by saying, God, use me. I was there when he saved the Gentiles. I saw it. God didn't require anything else for salvation. And we we can't either. Then in verse 12, and here Paul and Barnabas, they they get another chance to speak. And I love this. All the people kept silent. Wish we had that in my house right now, right? All the people kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul and they were, they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Again, they're giving evidence of what, not what they did, but what God did to save these Gentiles as they were out on their missionary journey. And they give zero evidence that God required anything else beyond his grace and his gospel to save them. Just trust in Jesus. Believe, believe in Jesus as Lord. Repent of your sins. That's it. Then in verse 13, James, brother James gets to speak in defense of salvation by grace alone. And he says this in verse 13. It's going to be a little, I'm going to, I'll explain it after I read this. After they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. So he's about to It's a good thing to do, to quote scripture. He's about to quote from the Old Testament in the book of Amos, right? He says in verse 16, After these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles, right, those that are not Jews, who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. James is making the point that Amos makes zero mention of Gentiles having to change to become a Jew to be in the kingdom of God. There's no mention of Gentiles having to be circumcised and following the law of Moses. Are you guys with me? He's, there's nothing. If Gentiles can be saved without doing these things in the kingdom of God, why are we trying to force it on them now? And he clarifies in verse 19. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. I love that word, trouble them. And don't throw extra burdens on them. Verse 20, and I'll explain this part too, but that, that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. Verse 21, for Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. James says this, we have no reason from scripture, not from scripture, not from Jesus, not from anything else why we would add to salvation. They are saved by Jesus alone, by His grace alone, just as we are. So no, a person doesn't need to be circumcised. And a person doesn't need to adhere to the law of Moses to be saved. Thank God for that, right? And however, he does go on and propose to the Gentiles different practices to abstain from. He advises them, man, refrain from things contaminated by idols. Refrain from sexual sins. And, and, And hold on to some dietary restrictions that we have. James is really asking them to do this to keep from offending their Jewish brothers that are still have that conviction of doing that. Are you guys with me? He's, it's, it's a brotherly thing at this point. There were still convictions that were held by these Jews. So James is saying, hey, let's, let's have some unity here and let's not offend one another. But his main major point and takeaway was this. We will not be burdering, burdering, putting a burden on our new brothers and sisters in Christ with unnecessary things. Man, do you guys know that song, Jesus Paid It All? Man, I love that song. But Jesus, he paid it all. It's finished. It's done, right? It's by his grace alone that we become part of the family of God. Thank God, because I've tried to do it, right? I mean, we we can't. There are a few things that I want us to take away concerning God's grace and the gospel this morning to give a little clarity. On your bulletins, if you guys would just fill this out, I would love for you guys to just follow along with me. And that's what Paul and Barnabas and, and Peter and James are doing. They give clarity. We need clarity sometimes, right? People try to muddy up the Bible. And it's like, man, let's just go to the Word of God. What does the Bible say? Let's get some clarity. And the first is this. Because of God's grace, the gospel is free. It was Jesus that accomplished our salvation. 
I didn't hang on the cross and raise from the dead. Jesus did that for me. Jesus accomplished it. He did it for all of us. He accomplished it. Church, we are saved by grace alone and we are saved in Christ alone. Not any religion, not any church, not any other thing, but Jesus. Jesus accomplished our salvation and we are saved because of His grace and we are saved in Jesus alone, in Christ alone. It's because of His death and resurrection. Check this out. He is our hope, our rock. He is our confidence. He is our power. He is our wisdom. He is our justification. He is our righteousness. He is our the one that sanctifies us. He is our redemption. He is our life. And He is why we can boast. Right? We get to wear the name tag of Christian only because of Jesus. He is all that we have. We're saved by grace alone in Christ alone. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith in who, church? Faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior, as God. And it is not of ourselves, right? That hurts us prideful people, doesn't it? Man, it's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not by our works. We don't get to boast about it. I don't get to walk around and say, hey, Levi, I saved myself today. How about you? Right? It doesn't work that way. That was, I just did, that was off the cuff, man. Jesus did all of that. Jesus and God's grace is why we have salvation and eternal life in Him. Are you guys with me on this one? It's Jesus. I read a quote that I wanted to share with you this morning. It says this. Talk about conviction. The only contribution that we make to our salvation is the sin that God so graciously forgives. Woo! Right? The only thing that we bring to the table, table, it's not our accomplishments, it's not our holiness, it's not our future righteousness. The only thing that we bring to the table is nothing but our sin that God so graciously forgives. Right? Jesus comes to the table with the already accomplished work of salvation. And we are just to come to the table. Right? Man, when we're sharing Jesus with people, sometimes we just, we get so confused and excited. We're like, I don't know what to say. Just tell them about Jesus. Right? We don't need to say all these other things. We just tell them about Jesus. The second thing for us this morning is this. This is a big one. When we add to or cheapen God's grace, we have misunderstood His gospel. When we are sharing the gospel with someone and we say, you have to believe in Jesus, but you also have to do this and this and this, we have misrepresented what Jesus came for. We misrepresented the good news of Jesus. Man, when we, we think about it, people run to Jesus because they realize that they're not capable of carrying the burdens of life and their own sin, Right? And that's why we do it. We, we, we figure that out. People need Jesus to carry that for them. And then we come, you come to them and say, okay, to get saved, you got to do this and this and this. They're like, okay, that's not what I was looking for. I was looking for the one that could carry it for me. Too many times we just get this control thing and, 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 and we just kind of go on and say, man, you're only saved if you do this and this and this. And I mean... Yes, when Jesus is the one that saves and transforms us. When we turn to Him as our Lord, here's the thing, man, Jesus changes us. He transforms us. We, we, we begin to, to want to be more and more like Him, to look more and more like Him. Right? I've, I've talked with quite a few people, right, and, and, and many in this church that would just say, man, I look at Scripture and I can't do that. Right? I am not capable of doing that. I don't care if you're six or you're 106. You're not capable of doing that. And so you come to Jesus and, and He saves you. And then He begins to transform your life. We begin to learn to be more obedient, to read our Bible, to be in prayer, to go to church, to live a life that is more pleasing to Him. But, but we do that because it was Jesus that made it possible. Right? He's the one that did the work. So when we're sharing the gospel with someone, don't overcomplicate it. Guys, don't make it difficult. Let's just stick to what Scripture says. Amen, church? Right? Man, we're saved when we believe that Jesus is Lord, that He was raised from the dead, that He died from our sins, that we need to turn from our sins and give our life to Jesus. Woo! That's it, right? Not plus the pluses. Don't add a bunch of other junk on there. And it's by grace alone and in Christ alone that we're saved. So the first thing was this. Because of God's grace, the gospel is what, church? Free. It was Jesus that accomplished our salvation. The second thing is that when we add to or cheapen God's grace, we have misunderstood the gospel. It is by grace alone and in Christ alone that we are saved. Nothing more and nothing less needs to be added. And the last thing is this. 
by God's grace. Sometimes we can just sit there and just kind of rest in that, can't we? Just God's grace. We are free from sin in this world, and we are free to share with this world. Paul says in Galatians 1.4 when he's dealing with this issue, Galatians 1.4, The Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Right? He gave himself on the cross for our sins. Why to rescue us from this present evil age? We live in an evil age, don't we? Man, he's rescuing us from that. The, the picture that, that Paul's given us here is that we're rescued from this present evil age, the, this world that we live in, and all the ways that are contrary to God's word. Now, obviously, we're not like rescued out of the world yet, right? We're still here, I think, right? Right? We're still here. But we're rescued from the power of this world and the ways of this world. We are freed from the chains and the dominion or the the domination that sin has over us. We can't break the chains on ourselves. That's why Jesus came and he did it. We can't break the grip of sin in this evil world. Jesus had to do it. It's the power of Jesus and his grace that sets us free from the guilt and punishment of our sin. And if you know Christ, man, you might struggle with the sin. But let me remind you, and this is something, man, remind yourself. Jeff, I, I, I remind myself. That sin has no power over you. Amen, church? You guys with me? That sin has no power over you. Take it to Jesus. Sometimes it's the last thing we do. It's like, okay, I'm just going to I'm going to rearrange my schedule so I don't do that anymore. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Just take it to Jesus, right? It has no power over you anymore. And by God's grace, we've experienced Jesus, his salvation. We are living proof of God's goodness and his forgiveness. And by God's grace, we are free to share Jesus with the world. How about that, guys? We get to be the witness of Jesus. We're free to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others, even to the remotest part of the world. Jews and Greeks, Tucson and Phoenix, right? We can even share Jesus with people up in Phoenix, man, right? ASU fans, man, we can still share Jesus with ASU people. No, man, (laughs) The gospel will be advanced to all the earth, and because of God's grace, because of the gospel, we get to participate in sharing of that good news. Man, we're on Team Jesus, man. And what a great reminder for us this morning. We were saved by God's grace. Now, I want you guys to hear me this morning. If you have not come to Jesus, if you've not kind of come to that table with Jesus and just said, man, Jesus, I need to make you Lord of my life. I want to turn away from my sins. I've tried. I'm working on this. If you've not made Him Lord of your life, He's already done that work, man. He's already done it. He's already done all the hard work. You just need to come to Jesus, right? Turn from that sin. Give it to Jesus. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. It means that God's going to work in your life to help you with that. But just believe in Him. That's it. And then you can sit across, you know, the table with Jesus and we're like, that's relief, right? Let's pray, church. God, we love you and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that, that you that you've given us this grace that we don't deserve. God, help us not muddy up the gospel. When we're sharing the gospel with somebody else, God, let us not make it more difficult than it is. Help us just lay it out there, what God has said, what God's word has said. Don't add a bunch of junk to it, God. Help us just stay focused on what you've said. And let's not take away from the gospel either. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is all that we need. And Father, I pray, Lord, if there's somebody in this room that does not know you as their Savior, they have not come to you and say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life, Lord, help them do that before they leave. Help them come up to me or somebody else. Help them not leave this property before they just say, let's talk about Jesus and his grace and his goodness and his gospel. Father, be with us as a church. Be with those that aren't here. For whatever it is going on in their life, God, bring it, bring us back together. Father, help us, help us continue to worship you. Help us continue to sing to you today. And just focus on Jesus and his goodness as we close out our service today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen.